welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, I'm both in a 1993 Toyota Land Cruiser, and in the past couple episodes, I removed the engine to do a full rebuild. This is the complete teardown from start to finish, summed up in quick clips. So obviously the very first thing we had to do was degrease this engine so that we could work on it without getting completely covered in oil, hit it with the pressure washer, and now we're getting started on the exhaust side first. We're removing the pair valve. This is something that was present on the 93 and 94 Land Cruisers and not on the later model years. It was essentially a small component used to inject fresh air into the exhaust system. For the exhaust manifolds, we are taking these off with the impact here, and they're coming off rather easy because we soaked them with PB Blaster in advance so that we wouldn't have any issues with them. And as you can see, they're both off now, and we're getting started on the coolant pipe that goes to the heater that attaches to the top of the thermostat housing right here. Just remove a couple of bolts, and this thing pops right off, and then we can remove the last component of the pair system attached to the side of the cylinder head, and then pop out this little tube that attaches to the top of the thermostat housing, just wiggles out of there. Now that the exhaust side is done, I can get started on the intake side. The first thing that I'm going to do is remove the throttle body. There are some harness plugs that need to be removed and four bolts that hold this to the upper intake manifold along with a couple of coolant lines that you have to remove and this will pop right off. Once the throttle body was off, I started turning the crank pulley to set the motor to top dead center and as you can see here, the rotor is now pointing towards cylinder one and I can remove the distributor from the cylinder head. This is another o-ring I'll need to replace and it was definitely leaking from this area. With the distributor removed, I'm now getting the alternator out of the way. Just going to remove the upper bolt and the bolt which holds it to the adjuster and this thing will wiggle right out. Next comes the coolant elbow and then I can get started on the front hard line for the vacuum which actually gave me some trouble. The bolt on the left side started rounding out and I tried to get it off with vice grips to no avail. I eventually pounded a smaller socket onto it and was able to remove the bolt as you'll see here. Once that bolt was out, I removed the front vacuum hardline tube and all of the vacuum lines with it. Then we had to move the 600 pound motor from the side of the house into the garage, which was kind of sketchy, and I let the oil drain overnight before starting on the rest of the teardown. Now I'm removing the dipstick, which has yet another o-ring that will need to be replaced and loosening the bolts that hold the upper intake to the lower intake manifold and then removing the upper intake manifold. With the upper intake manifold out of the way, I can get started on removing the fuel rail and injectors, but first I have to remove this hose for the fuel pressure regulator. In order to get the lower intake manifold off, I had to disconnect the wiring which runs through the lower intake runners. These clips are old and brittle and the sensors are too, so I had to be really careful not to destroy the harness. I did end up breaking all six injector clips and one of the knock sensor clips. All of this will be fixed by the time the engine goes back into the cruiser. The wiring harness will then snake out from between the intake runners and then the lower intake manifold can be removed. With the intake and exhaust manifolds out of the way along with all of their accessories, I can now remove the cylinder head. But before I do that, I need to remove the valve cover in the camshafts in order to access the cylinder head bolts. There are 13 valve cover bolts if I remember correctly, and these gaskets are always rock hard and should be replaced. Mine are already new. I'm zip tying the cam gear to the sprocket even though I'm replacing the chain and sprocket. It's just out of habit, I guess. The timing chain guide is the reason for this entire rebuild. Watch the previous episodes if you're curious why the motor has to come out for something so small. The camshafts have areas on the shaft for a wrench to hold it still while you remove the timing chain gear. After the sprocket bolt is removed, the sprocket will pop right off. These Land Cruisers have a split gear on the exhaust cam which needs to be held in place before it's removed and that's what I'm doing here with the bolt. This locks it in place so that it doesn't come apart once the cam is removed from the cylinder head. There are caps that hold the camshafts into the head and these have to come off in a specific order which may not be too apparent in this video since it's edited but there is a procedure you have to follow to make sure these come out evenly. There is pressure pushing upwards against the camshafts from the valve springs and if you remove them carelessly you can warp a camshaft, your cylinder head, or even both. That's an extremely expensive mistake for something that can be so easily avoided by following proper procedure. Once most of the cam caps are removed, you can remove the final two caps as per the FSM, alternating back and forth, and the cam will lift right out. The intake cam is removed following the exact same procedure, minus the split cam gear. 
I always mark these shims because they have a direct relationship to the cam lobe that they live under. I'm sending my cylinder head off for a valve job anyway, which is going to change the clearances, but it's still good practice to keep these in order. Those cam caps in the previous clip, those need to stay in order as well. Now I'm removing the cylinder head bolts, which as you guessed it, are another thing that have to be done in order. These are removed in a cross pattern essentially that relieves the pressure evenly as you loosen the bolts. There are 14 bolts I believe that hold the cylinder head on, and you can see on the surface I've marked with a paint pen the order in which to remove them. With these bolts removed, the cylinder head will pop right off of the cylinder block and now we can see the cylinders and pistons underneath which look surprisingly good for a 230,000 mile motor. That's just Toyota engineering, I guess. Here I'm removing the knock sensors which detect vibration or knock and are looking for signs of abnormal combustion and will send a signal to the ECU if present. While tearing it apart, I found this nice little crack in the block which I go into detail about in the previous episodes if you're interested. Next up are the motor mounts and anything else which has to come off to strip this down to a bare block. That includes this coolant elbow, thermostat housing, and the thermostat that lives inside of it. You'll notice some of the bolts are rusty and oxidized and all of this will be fixed prior to the engine rebuild. I also need to remove the oil cooler that's built into the side of the block, which I thought was a pretty cool feature of this 1FZ engine. Definitely something you wouldn't see on a light duty motor. This motor never seems to stop leaking though, even when it's out of the Land Cruiser and hopefully rotating this thing over will finally drain all of the oil and coolant out of it. This engine has two oil pans much like the 2JZ and the lower pan comes off first followed by the upper pan. You can see the pickup tube right here, that's what sucks oil into the motor. The upper pan is actually a girdle and is providing strength and rigidity to the block by connecting the sides together. It's just another thing that sets this engine apart from a light duty engine and I thought that was really interesting. With the upper pan removed we can now see the crankshaft and the rods. The crank pulley has to come off next and this bolt is torqued to 304 foot pounds. Next up is the timing cover which as you would guess covers the timing components such as the chain, guides, and sprockets. This timing chain guide on the left is the reason why the engine is out of the truck. This is how far I would have had to tear it down in the frame to replace that one guide. The last thing that comes off is the oil pump gear and at this point I'm ready to remove the pistons and the rods. These are the rod caps which connect the rods to the crankshaft and there are bearings between these caps that wear with age. But the bearings from this engine looked incredibly good for 230,000 miles. This is very, very light wear that you see right here. I'm taking general oil clearances here using plastic gauge, which is basically a thin piece of plastic that smashes down and gives you a very, very rough estimate of what your clearance is between the bearing and the journal down to the thousandths or ten thousandths of an inch. A more accurate way, of course, would be to use a dial bore gauge and a micrometer, but for the purpose of this teardown and per the FSM, this will do. All six of the rods are within standard clearance, and I'll go ahead and hand this information over to the machine shop so they know where the engine was at in terms of clearances beforehand. I had to do the exact same thing for all six main bearings, which are the crankshaft bearings, and all of those were in spec too. So that's going to wrap up this teardown, and if you guys like this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, and turn on the notification bell, and check out the previous videos if this was interesting to you. Thanks for watching. Later. Here we go at the top of the class on a roll, and it's time to run it up. Yeah, you know, maxed out, put the pedal to the floor. Hey, on a roll, here we go. Here